Foundation, for those of you who haven't heard of him. And Mark, uh, Mark Kerrigan is currently a digital fellow at the Sociological Review, which is a respected academic journal um, which actively promotes an international and interdisciplinary approach to sociology. Um, he studied philosophy at UCL before turning to the bright side, um, social theory and, and sociology. Um, he's the author of um, Social Media for Academics. Um, <laughs> Um, he jointly edits the Sociological Imagination and jointly um, organises the Accelerated Academy project as well. Um, he has an interest in the links between personal change and social change, um, and in the way knowledge production and our identity as academics um, is being transformed by digitisation. So he's the perfect person to be speaking to us today, and we're really glad, grateful that he's decided to, um, to come and speak to us. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you. And it's a really brilliant event uh, that I hope we can see more of, both in terms of the topic, but also how it's organised in the day. And when thinking about what to say, I found myself drifting back to three different public statements by prominent politicians that I think are illustrative of the context within public sociology it takes place and the urgency with which I think we can uh, characterise it. The first is in August 2011 when David Cameron stood outside Downing Street and declared that the riots that had spread throughout, the, throughout England over the past five days were criminality pure and simple. There was nothing more to say about them. This was the end of the conversation. We must move on and condemn rather than analyse. The second was when the Canadian Prime Minister Stephen Harper, after a foiled terror attack in April 2013, he said that now is not a time to commit sociology. And I remember being gripped by this phrase at the time. It's such a clumsy but oddly beautiful phrase, commit sociology. In his hostility to what we do, I think he articulated it wonderfully, the impulse to do sociology, to use it to achieve an end in the world. And the third case is, well, could be many statements by this man, but I chose this one because it's the from the first time I watched one of his rallies in full on YouTube, I hasten to add, rather than being there in person. And I'd really recommend the experience if you want to understand Donald Trump, because he's oddly fascinating when you see his uh, improvisation as he stands up and rants and speaks off the top of his head. But in this case, he said, we're going to win so much, you may even get tired of winning. And this is a statement that fascinated me for its banality. What does it actually mean? And yet, when we look back on the success he's had since then, the combination of banality and the acquisition of political power, I think, is something that invites explanation. Even if, increasingly, there is a lot of evidence that perhaps the reasons for his success are very contingent to do with the cephology and the changing voting conditions in America. And I think these cases are interesting because I think they are suggestive of a contraction of explanatory horizons in public debate something pursued and enforced by the most powerful politicians in these nations, where we are increasingly incited to not analyse, to not look behind the brute facts of social action, but instead to simply accept what has happened as a given and move on, to morally condemn on that basis rather than to seek the origins of social action in social structure. And I think in this context, we can have a sense of the urgency of public sociology. And I think the, the term itself is very interesting. The sense in which it arguably lacks a clear definition. And yet at an event like this, we all pretty much feel we know what we're talking about when we talk about public sociology. And I think the sense of urgency is something that we should perhaps be cautious about, or at least take it as a, as a reason to stop and analyse because I think it ties into a broader set of transitions within higher education. And the relationship between public sociology and the impact agenda is a very interesting one, I think. Um, we could almost see public sociology as a bottom-up approach in, in contrast to the top-down imposition of the impact agenda. And I think these contrasting scales are part of the reason why the impact agenda provokes such ambivalence. I love John Brewer's statement um, that he made uh, some time ago now, but that impact is at one and the same time an object of confusion and acclaim, anxiety and confidence. And I'm very interested in the way in which we have this ambivalent relationship to impact 
on the one hand, it's something imposed. It's part of the transformation of academic labour as the injunction to be engaged is added to the already cumbersome body of obligations academics are subject to in their professional life. But on the other hand, it's something that people feel compelled to do. It's something people want to do. They want to make a difference with their research. They want to try and make a difference to the world. And so the impact agenda pulls people in both directions. And we can see this in the kind of language and rhetoric that the impact <laughs> agenda uses. The injunction to get out there, to put your research to work, to engage with the public, to be an engaged researcher. And the, pr the promise that if you do do this, you will be a more authentic, fulfilled researcher, you'll be a better researcher through your engagement. But conversely, we see the stick as well as the carrot. The statement that actually you have to do this. It's what academic labour now involves. You'll be left behind if you don't do it. And this oscillation between the positive and the negative, I think is something that we need to think carefully about with the impact agenda. Uh, because there are spaces for strategic manoeuvring within it. <coughs> but we need to be careful about accidentally reinforcing this tendency towards academic labour now being compelled to get out there. Both because I think it's problematic in its own terms. I think it mystifies the change that's taking place in academic labour. But also, I think it's not conducive to doing impact well. It's not conducive to good engagement. It props up this very simplified view of the relationship between the university and wider society, where we are in here with our knowledge, and they are out there needing our knowledge. And this view can ground uh, an, a, a great deal of enthusiasm. And I'm very interested in how we can channel that enthusiasm in more productive directions. Because I think we need to be sceptical of this idea that we now have an opportunity to overcome the gap between town and gown, to break down the walls of the ivory tower and radically democratise scholarship. Don't get me wrong, I think we should do all those things. But I don't think they're as simple as compelling people to be engaged, compelling people to get out there. And it's in this context that I think we also need to be careful about excessive enthusiasm for social media. I say having written a book about why academics should use social media. But the problem is that social media can often be seized upon as a way of achieving these ends. If we're compelled towards achieving impact, then now we have these new powerful tools that will allow us to transcend the boundaries of the ivory tower, get out there and talk to people directly. And social media can help us transcend these boundaries, but the reality of how that operates is much more complex than this framing allows for. And I'm going to argue today that much as we need to be careful and critical and reflexive about sociological knowledge and about the boundaries of the academy. We also need to be careful, critical and reflexive about what we take social media to be, how it can be used. Because I think there are powerful tools here, but they're ones with very serious pitfalls. And unless we're aware of these, our use of social media can actually get in the way of the practice of public sociology rather than facilitating it. But a good place to start with this is what does it mean to be a public sociologist? And in Lambros Patis' PhD thesis, which I highly recommend, he very skillfully identifies how there's actually a long prehistory to the term. Whereas it's often associated with Michael Borowoy's 2004 presidential address to the ASA. But actually, as a term, it's something that we can find earlier proponents of. So Stephen Seedman, Herbert Gans, Ben Agger, and as a practice itself, as sociology acting with and for publics outside the academy, addressing issues of public concern, this is something that's been part of the discipline since its inception. And so perhaps we could see public sociology as a tendency, as a perpetual tendency within the discipline, one which is always acting within new circumstances and perhaps needs to be invented, reinvented in light of those circumstances. But there's a broader uncertainty here, I think, that we need to address about what is it we are doing? And if this is a matter of sociological knowledge, this raises the question of what is this knowledge that we're putting to work? What is this knowledge we're feeling compelled to get out there and to use to make a difference in the world? The trite answer to that question is sociological knowledge is knowledge produced by sociologists. But I don't think that really gets us anywhere in addressing this. And I think when we start to look at this question, we realise that Sociology is an extremely fragmented discipline. 
And that fragmentation is something that, among many other factors, shapes its public status. The relative visibility of economists and psychologists uh, in contrast to sociologists in the public sphere, I think is explained by a whole host of factors. It's a very complex issue. But the extent to which economists and psychologists can, to some degree, present themselves as representing a stable, cumulative, agreed-upon body of knowledge, I think is one factor that helps them act in a public way, that helps the self their self-presentation in the media and in policy circles. And in contrast to this, the fragmentation of sociology can seem like a desperate failing. It can seem some, like something that will make public status, public action very difficult. But I'd suggest that actually this could be seen as a virtue, that we need to reframe what it is we see ourselves as bringing to public debate. And perhaps this could be seen negatively, which is why I started with these cases, that even if in our fragmented discipline we lack agreement about basic theoretical perspectives, we lack any kind of epistemic consensus. Nonetheless, maybe sociologists are united by the things they're opposed to. Maybe we agree upon forms of public reasoning, ways of addressing social problems that we deem to be problematic. We, we share an antipathy towards individualization. We share an antipathy towards the claim that moral condemnation can substitute for analysis. We share a concern to explain social action in terms of social context and to look beyond what happened to see how those happenings were shaped <coughs> by factors that predate the events in question. And for this reason, I think that these are only illustrative cases, but I think it can be useful to look at these kinds of public statements and to see what they tell us about what can unite us. And perhaps in this sense, we could see the role of sociological knowledge as being a case of correcting, opposing, attacking these kinds of reductive analyses and their place within public debates. And so that's sociological knowledge. Um, I think we also have to be careful about how we conceive of the inside and outside. Uh, I love the subtitle of this event, What is it to be a research, do research outside the academy? Because I think that is a, a question that always has a different answer. And there are some trends that I think are very interesting in terms of the relationship of sociology to the academy, which have only really started to develop in the last uh, five to ten years, that are being accentuated by social media. The first is clinical sociology, uh, which is something that's been established in the U United States for quite some time. But I recently uh, helped set up the practical sociology group in the UK, albeit that's not a name I'm a fan of because it implies all of the sociology is impractical, but that's a different question. And this is uh, trying to encourage sociologists working in industry, sociologists working in the third sector, sociologists working in government, to sustain a professional identity as a sociologist, to recognise the extent to which they are using sociological methods and, sociological and developing sociological approaches, and to try and overcome the, 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 the separation between those who are inside the academy and those who are outside. And I think social media can play a really important role here because it allows participation, even at a distance from the academy. It allows one to continue to engage in sociological discussion and contribute to sociological debates. And this is something that's becoming increasingly important to independent researchers, people who are continuing to identify as an academic in their capacity as freelance social researchers, often doing similar work to clinical sociologists and practical sociologists, but in a way that is shaped, in a way that is uh, freelance, is running their own business usually, uh, rather than having a permanent role within an organisation. And the third broader tendency is the alt-academic movement, which is something that emerged from the United States. But of people self-consciously foregoing the identity of an aspiring academic and seeking out other opportunities post-PhD other than a traditional academic career path, but nonetheless sustaining a commitment to research, and I think in doing so, complicating the distinction between being inside and outside. And these are just three cases, and I suspect there are more that I'm not familiar with, of ways in which the communications technology we use are changing the way our career pathways operate. And I think this is something that if we have discussions about doing sociology outside of the academy, we have to be very careful to address. But conversely, when we talk about inside the academy, I think this is becoming an ever more complex issue. 
because of the level of precarity in UK academia, when over half of UK academics are on fixed term or non-standard contracts, with the Russell Group proudly leading the way. And even for people who do have secure <coughs> non-fixed term employment within the academy, increasingly I don't think we can assume that those people enjoy autonomy, that they enjoy professional security. I think the question of what is it to be inside the academy is becoming more complicated with time. And I think we need to be careful for this reason about this boundary between inside and outside and how we conceptualise it as if there are securely employed <coughs> autonomous academics in here, waiting to get out there and do sociological work. And thirdly, before I stop being negative and start to talk about some slightly more positive things, I think we have to be careful about social media uh, as well, for three reasons. The first is in terms of the contestation inherent in the platform. Because, uh, as Badiou once put it, academics have excessive confidence in their powers of language. And I think when we have this belief in the power of language, the value of debate and discussion, coupled with the tendency of social media platforms to reward <coughs> antagonism, this can generate a sense in that we are doing something inherently public and inherently political, when perhaps in actual fact we're just having arguments with people on the internet. And I think this is something we actually have to be very careful about, uh, to be clear about what it is to be public in our use of social media. Who are we engaging with? Who is engaged with us? Do we assume that simply because it is potentially public that we are doing public sociology? And I think these are questions we can answer quite easily, but they're ones which the novelty of social media sometimes prevents us from asking. And this is further compounded by the extent to which we are already primed to think of ourselves in quantitative terms. Academics at UK universities are potentially subject to over 100 metrics. We are already primed to compare ourselves to others and evaluate our own position in quantitative terms. And the extent to which social media platforms are based around quantitative measurement, where we are positioned in a hierarchy defined by very crude measures, such as follow accounts, likes, <coughs> retweets. And I think all these factors can make social media something rather tempting for academics, something people can be drawn into. And this does not mean that we shouldn't do it, but I think we should be aware of the way in which our academic habitus is something that can be, if not manipulated, at least channeled in problematic ways by social media platforms. Because these are ones in which contention is rewarded. The greater the reaction a particular use of social media provokes, the greater the visibility that use will have. And intellectual virtue is only one of many factors that might shape the visibility and circulation of a tweet or a blog post, and it's far from the foremost one. And as well as recognising the risk that we get a bit too sucked into it, we also have to be aware of the fact that there's nothing inherently about these platforms that mean that academic ideas are liable to thrive on them. In some ways, they could be seen as actually quite hostile to academic ideas. And the temptation, therefore, is that we feel impelled to trivialise or render our ideas in a more contentious way in order to improve their circulation and transmission online. So these are three notes of caution uh, about the character of sociological knowledge the idea of the distinction between the inside and the outside and about social media is something that allows us to transcend that distinction, to get out there, to put our sociological knowledge to work. But more positively, uh, I'm offering these notes of caution, not because I think that we should reject social media, but actually because I think it's an incredibly important tool for public sociology. But if we uncritically adopt this framing of it, it can become very difficult to use it effectively, to use it in a way that takes advantage of the opportunities without incurring the opportunity costs, the possibility that actually even if we are deriving some value as public sociologists from it, the time and energy we're spending on it is time and energy that could be more effectively spent elsewhere. And I think loosely we could see the potential value for public sociology in terms of two concepts that Michael Burroway offered, the idea of traditional public sociology and organic public sociology. By traditional public sociology, he means sociologists working in the media, sociologists writing editorials, 
writing articles, being interviewed as experts. And I think rather than social media being about dissemination, offering a way of getting beyond the intermediaries in the media to get our message out directly, we could perhaps more usefully see it as a way of building new kinds of relationships with people in the media. Because insofar as that we're talking about our research online, we're leaving a digital footprint. And journalism and broadcast media are increasingly digitalized. Researchers and journalists will increasingly look for experts on social media. And if we are attentive to the digital footprint that we leave and we make ourselves discoverable, it becomes easier for journalists and uh, broadcasters to find us. And new opportunities start to open up as well as new opportunities to sustain connections after a particular collaboration. So not just to be interviewed as an expert on a particular topic after a journalist finds your writing online, but to actually build a relationship that can generate collaborations after that. And if this relationship was one that required face-to-face -face meeting and regular exchange, it wouldn't be possible. But if it can be as simple as occasionally discussing the issues that you share of interest in on Twitter, then the potential for these organic collaborations to arise with the media, I think is quite pronounced. But there are also a lot of new media platforms that are developing, and I think these are really exciting. The much more specialized, almost narrow-casted platforms that are emerging, which perhaps would not have worked in the economics of uh, old media. And a lot of these magazines, things like E.ON, uh, Open Democracy, Nauticlus, Pacific Standard, there's a whole rich vein of these new kinds of online-only publications <coughs> that are very hungry for scholarly analysis. They are very engaged with critical social science. And there are many new opportunities for sociologists to write and engage through these channels, each of which has their own existing audience in a way that overcomes this inherent difficulty of how to ensure that anyone, any, what you do online wins an audience, because the audience is already there. And it can be uh, deployed and it can be accessed through these new kinds of intermediaries. And thirdly, I think there's a real possibility to build our own platforms. Uh, and these are two examples that I'm involved in. The first being Discover Society, the online magazine. And the second, the Sociological Review. And I think these kinds of platforms, particularly when they have a focus on public sociology, are really important because they allow a more attentive, a greater degree of attentiveness to what we're trying to communicate. And I think if we have these platforms, then engaging on social media ceases to be an individualized pursuit. And crucially, some of these platform dynamics, some of these pathologies that social media generates, are mediated through a collective structure, through a collective enterprise. And I think this is really important, and all I'm talking about here are fairly mundane issues, such as having a comments policy, not uh, ensuring that the author of a particular piece is the person looking at the comments that people leave on that piece in case any are hostile, having an established accumulated body of expertise about translating sociological knowledge into a vernacular that's more effective online having existing networks that can be drawn upon for disseminating particular pieces and ensuring that they reach uh, a valuable audience. And these are really straightforward things, but I think the enterprise of using, public, using social media for public sociology is transformed when it goes through these kinds of collective platforms. And the, the cost and the technical difficulty of building structures like this is very limited. And I think there's real possibilities that we can think about a proliferation of platforms for public sociology that we can use to actually intervene in debates um, to counter the spread of these reductive and problematic forms of analysis. But I think we also need to move beyond the idea of simply communicating sociological knowledge. So there are, there are very exciting new possibilities that social media opens up for what Howard Becker called telling about society. New ways of learning to, learning to communicate using audio, video, for instance. But what's more exciting is if we think of this in terms of collaborations. Uh, in his writing of public sociology, Pierre Bourdieu once talked about collaborating with artists to give symbolic force to critical ideas. And I think these are all very exciting possibilities that 
Digital technology in general opens up, but social media provides dissemination mechanisms that are potentially very powerful, but we have to be very careful about what we take those mechanisms to be and how they operate. But it also creates opportunities for working with communities in new ways, uh, particularly when the communities we research are very active on social media. My experience of doing research with the asexual community for six years was that when you're working with groups of people who are already using the internet in a very self-directive and self-defining way, it's very hard not to, be drawn in <coughs> not to be drawn into a public role. And I think there's a broader uh, trend here where the rise of social media is narrowing the gap between researchers and the groups they research. And I think this can create problems, but it creates real new opportunities for an organic public sociology role in relation to groups we work with, where we can act as advocates and allies in uh, a whole range of different ways. But it also creates new opportunities for groups to form and for us to support groups and intervene in the formation of, formation of groups. And finally, I think it also creates opportunities for engaging students as a public, both in new ways while they're at university doing sociology degrees, but continuing that engagement afterwards to create new, new ways for students to continue to interact with sociological ideas and participate in sociological discussion. And so to bring to a close then, I think at the, pro at the moment we have a slight problem in the public sociology debate because the structures of scholarly communications as they currently stand, journals, books, etc., they tend to channel the impulse towards public sociology, the impulse to commit sociology, into silos. They tend to channel it into abstract discussion, even when people want to do it. And I'm not for a second suggesting that Theoretical discussion about public sociology is problematic, far from it. But I think that this kind of methodological, ethical and conceptual discussion is something we always have to remember is serving a practical purpose. And it should always serve that purpose. And journals are often not the best outlet for discussions that are orientated towards the doing of public sociology. There was something David Miller said uh, in 2011 that really stuck with me ever since... I read it, that we don't need to debate public sociology anymore. We need to get good at it. And I think getting good at it is something that will require conceptual discussion sometimes, but it's also fundamentally a practical pursuit and ones that are perhaps best explored in events like this rather than by writing journal articles. And I think a crucial part of that is about building platforms, with these being just two examples, but we need platforms for public sociology. We need to develop new ways of turning what might otherwise be an isolated individual pursuit, a private pursuit, into a collective enterprise. And hopefully today is something that will contribute to that end. Thank you. I think it's, you know, they're complex organisations and so I think that there's one hand telling us to participate and engage, the other, ad, you know, imposing constraints upon it. Uh, I'm still cautiously optimistic the impact agenda is something that's still in process and the, the Stern Review recommendations for how to change impact for the next ref, I'm cautiously optimistic that they could help create this culture in terms of, dis in terms of disentangling the notion of impact from particular research outputs. And so if I understand the consequences of this correctly, that would mean that actually a, a trajectory of activity could be seen as counting impact for as impact for assessment purposes, rather than the impact of a particular journal article, say. 
And I think that could open up a significant space, depending on how it's implemented on, on the ground. Um, and maybe if that does start to happen, the administrative discussions about how we create a climate within which these obstacles are minimised could begin to unfold. <laughs> Optimism or despair? <laughs> I was just interested in the idea of kind of development of um, collective platforms, um, and then obviously those two are ones that aren't linked to a particular university. I just wondered the extent to which you feel it's important that kind of those collective platforms are not sort of institutional based. Or, yeah. Uh, I think in terms of their scale, it could actually be better in some ways if they are institutionally based. Um, because it facilitates their sustainability. And so, I mean, the Sociological Review, in a sense, is institutional-based, but it's based as an independent charity. And I think there's a security that comes from that. And Discover Society is something that runs on gift labour, effectively, although it is actually registered as an independent trading company. Um, and I think a key part of thinking about the sustainability of these platforms is how they will go through changes how the, the editor, editing of them will change over time, to have processes that allow for a handover. And I think an institutional embedding is actually very useful for that. But being attached to a university obviously comes with constraints. And I think there are some very interesting issues opening up about how communications departments see the challenges, communications uh, fact, people see the challenges of social media and the regulatory implications of that in terms of social media policies for institutions could change this landscape by over-regulating in response to the risk to the corporate brand. And I think that's the, that's the main danger I see about these platforms being based in institutions. The university will be too concerned with how it looks to the institution if something goes wrong. Yeah, yeah I mean, that's my experience is often the gulf in terms of points of work you're talking about the same thing, but you see it in completely different ways. Yeah. Just picking up on your comment with respect to journals and um, online publications, and how important do you see the peer review process in this kind of digital environment? And on the back of that, who becomes that peer group in terms of this inside outside institution? Uh, the second part of that question is fascinating, and I've never really thought about that, to be honest. Um, in terms of the first, I, I think peer review is important, but it serves a slightly different purpose, where the editing is analogous, the review is analogous to the editing of a magazine. So part of it is about distilling the ideas to get beyond the sometimes impenetrable jargon and to kind of chip away and get to the core of what's, trying, what's being expressed. And so, I, you know, I think the the ends of that process are different to peer review traditionally construed. And I think it's something that works best when the person who's doing the editing actually has the time and space to act on it. And this is another reason why I think institutional embedding for these platforms is important. Because it's taken seriously as an editing role, but a very different kind of editing role to editing a journal. And I think recognition for that is crucial. Um, and yeah, this, the second part of that question is, is really fascinating. I've not thought about it in those terms. So I'd like to think about it and get back to you. Yes, I'd like to know your view about the difference between academic um, um, activism of uh, criticizing <laughs> social reform firms um, and uh, academic activism of uh, proposing new ways of doing things. Um, Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think the first is, could be construed as traditional public sociology. And I'm suggesting in terms of this more negative approach to what we share in our conception of what sociology can bring to public debate, that that is something that can focus us in terms of objects of critique, you know, common points that we agree ought to be opposed. But the, the second issue, I think, is a fascinating one. Um, Bourdieu once talked about the possibility of 
social scientists becoming an applied research division of social movements and the extent to which those kinds of collaborations can take place over, over time and to build infrastructures that facilitate them, I think are really important. And part of my interest in clinical sociology and uh, practical sociology is because there is excellent social research often being done in N N NGOs, charities. And I think to increase the dialogue that takes place between sociologists and social researchers working in those organizations and academia is really valuable. And to maybe try and develop ways of bringing that dialogue into, a pub into the public sphere to facilitate the expansion of those debates and to see what uh, builds on top of them. But I, I think that the dynamics that shape this are so, set, so specific to specific organisations that I'm slightly cautious about generalising, apart from, you know, at a very abstract level. Um, I have a you know, question about, you said, uh, you mentioned ivory towers, you know, in your initial uh, address when you started. Um, and we have these journals which don't, which are not open access to the public. So all this academic writing, some of which is brilliant um, and great work, how does that go to the public? Because what happens, what I feel is, the the rhetoric for the public is currently being shaped by journalists, and they write and they say and they shape the views of people because that's more accessible to the general public. What we do is brilliant work, but then it just stays limited within the side clubs of the academia. So how are we going to, in the future, break that barrier and reach our writing and our ideas to the people who are affected by our research? We can use social media to do that, but I think one of the most interesting but also occasionally worrying experiences of using social media for this kind of work is that we can confront the fact that actually the publics we're writing for might not be interested in what we're doing. And the writing as it takes place in journals might not be, trans might not be relevant, might not be seized upon, and might sometimes actually provoke a hostile reaction. And I think we can overestimate the value of translation. So we see this straightforwardly as translating knowledge from a specialised form into a non-specialised form. But I, I think to put existing knowledge to work that is necessary. But I, I think there's a broader issue here about what we take social problems to be. And I think we can sometimes slip into the view that actually social problems are caused by a deficit of social knowledge. And that if only we allow our social knowledge to circulate more widely, the social problems will be fixed. And I think social problems are thorny, difficult, messy things. And I think fixing them is something that's always going to be a collective endeavour. It's always going to be a collective enterprise. And our writing and analysis and knowledge is something that can inform that endeavour. But I, I don't think it's necessary to it. And I don't think it's ever going to be sufficient. And so I think we have to be realistic about our public scope and our public role. And I think the confrontation with the public, the encounters with the public we can have through social media are very useful ways of instilling that realism in us. <laughs>